some of the things that I'm doing. Um, so I'm going to be covering a lot of information in this, in this presentation. So take notes. And if you've got questions, put them on chat. Umesh will pick them up and hopefully we'd have time at the end to answer them. This is uh, broadly what I'll be covering. A little bit about myself, a, a bit more detail on what do we mean by we are what we eat, a very brief understanding of the benefits and barriers of exercise, how we set goals, and quite a few tips and ideas on things we can do to get started. My background uh, until 2013 because I actually worked for BT in the IT field. So and I did 42 years at BT. During my time at BT, I had a couple of major road traffic accidents. Uh, and you can see that 2001 and 2008. And it resulted in a number of injuries. I began to gain a lot of weight because my exercise routine really dropped my BMI, which is an obese level that went to 30 and I became a fairly heavy breather. Consultants recommended that I have neck and knee surgery, which I have avoided as a result of doing various exercise routines that I've been doing fairly regularly for a good two decades now. I'm a qualified yoga teacher. Ramesh has gone through this and, and a personal trainer. I've done a lot of volunteering for organizations like the British Heart Foundation, Macmillan, and a first responder for London Ambulance. The thing with the London Ambulance is it's actually taught me the importance of exercise. And because when, you, when you're called up for a 999 call, you're generally dealing with people who are seriously ill. And so my aim became, how can I help people become less ill, become healthy, in this, especially as we get older. So what do we mean by we are what we eat? It ignored a lot of detail on this slide, but if you look at our human body, it's made up of atoms. Those atoms eventually form into cells, fibers, muscle fibers, and those fibers combine into forming various organs. And it's, it's the multiple organs, the bone structure that forms the human body. Now, the statement we are what we eat comes from all of these guys need material to survive. That material is food, and the quality of the food that we supply will determine the quality of our tissues, the quality of our organs, and therefore potentially the diseases. Another way of looking at this. We think of our body as a machine, a clock, if you like. If we're eating a lot of food that is processed, very high in sugar, high in salt, high in saturated fat, then the likelihood is we will develop a, a, a beer gut, as people would say, but our clock becomes rusty. If we get the right level of nutrition, the right level of exercise, in a balanced lifestyle generally, then we'd have a perfectly working clock. So let's think about our human body as a machine, racing car in most of your cases. Now we need fuel. Now fuel is provided by what's known as macronutrients. That's proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. I've shown pictures of how we could obtain healthy proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. And I've got a few slides explaining and giving examples of healthy proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Now, the fuel is what our engine will need. But in addition, we need the spark plugs to get going. These are called micronutrients and photonutrients. And they largely supply the vitamins and minerals that our body needs. 
And the vitamins and minerals are derived from fruit and veg, as you, as you can see from the picture. One of the things I wanted to point out to you is the principle of Ayurvedic medicine dating back to 4th century BCE. Is, is the recommendation is you fill a third of your stomach with liquid, a third with food, and leave the rest empty to aid digestion. Now, what we eat will vary by individual to individual. Uh, each person is different, our body types are different, and our personal choices will be different. So I think it's very important for us to choose the things that suit our body. What suits me may not suit another person. So there's no right answer, it's the answer that's correct for you at the right level of nutrition. And we can avoid, that's the last message, we can avoid supplements, uh, I'm not just saying we can eliminate, there may be people who are deficient in certain vitamins, vitamin D is, is typically mentioned, B12 is another example, but largely we can avoid uh, additional supplementary vitamins and minerals. There's a recommendation from the NHS is that we have 50% carbs, 30% protein and 20% fat. Sorry, that should be the other way around. 30% fat and 20% protein. I don't actually fully agree with the guideline because I think it's misleading. And I'll explain why it can be misleading uh, shortly. There is another pro program called intermittent fasting. And in this one formal agree arrangement called Body FX Fat Loss Program. If we go through a fat loss program routine, then the proportions of carbs, protein, and fat would change significantly. Now, to explain why I think the NHS guidelines can be misleading, I'm going to go through and explain the carbs, proteins, and fats. Now, I think the key message here is we need to avoid processed foods, fried foods, nasto. Nasto is effectively savory, deep fried savory products, mitai, Indian sweets, and avoid using saturated fat. I'll explain why I recommend rapeseed oil and olive oil as, as better oils than vegetable oil or coconut oil. So what are carbs? Carbs is what our body needs. It's our energy source. There's two types of carbs, simple carbs and complex carbs. Simple carbs absorb very quickly and we would get a sugar spike. I'll show you a chart that explains that shortly. Complex carbs have a much slower absorption rate into the blood, uh, into the bloodstream and actually can aid weight management. I've got in the picture examples of good carbs and bad carbs. Uh, and we measure how good or how bad they are by one measure is glycemic index. So I'll go on to explain the glycemic index. What we see here is a food that has got a high glycemic index. And as you can see, you get a sugar spike. And within the hour, that sugar spike has almost declined. And what's worse is it could decline to below the previous level. Now, what that would do is it would make you feel that I need to have more food. And the likelihood is you will snack on the same high glycemic index food. If you look at close, like low glycemic index foods, much lower sugar spike and it lasts for much longer two minutes, sometimes longer. So it's important for us to understand the glycemic index for food and manage our diet accordingly. <coughs> this is very important for people who've got diabetes to consider. Next slide gives you some examples of high and low. And I think we all know things like chips, excessive biscuits, dates, and, and potatoes I, are high carb foods, high glycemic index foods, and things like vegetables, lentils, oats are better for you. And I, I think as a gut feel, we all know that. This is just a simple table explaining the levels 
the rest of the information is the same. So food that has a low glycemic index, 55 or less is considered to be low, 56 to 69, medium, above 70 high. I've got a table later on giving you examples of this. Let's talk about protein now. Protein is very important for us. It helps repair cells and it makes new cells. Animal protein, such as red meat, eggs, dairy products, do contain high amounts of saturated fat, and therefore they're not really recommended. Uh, or or you, if, you, if you really need to, in very small quantities. Because these saturated fat products can increase cholesterol levels leading to heart diseases. Examples of whole plant-based proteins are shown on the picture. The key thing to do is control how much you eat. And that's what the pie chart showed us earlier. It's four types. Let's talk about fats, four types of fats saturated fats and trans fatty fats. They're the one that would result in high cholesterol or bad cholesterol, monosaturated and poly, polyunsaturated fats uh, are, are better for you. They consist of things like omega-9, omega-3 and 6. They can aid as part of your diet to reduce cholesterol. They also assist with uh, cardiovascular disease issues. I've done a quick review of the different oils just to justify why oil, olive and rapeseed are quite good. So if I take a, time, a, a second to understand what these tables mean, then I'll copy the rest across. We look at what's the calories, and this is per tablespoon. How much fat does it have? How much of that is saturated fat? And in this example, you can see rapeseed is a lot less saturated, under half, compared to olive. Monosaturates, polyunsaturates, phenol, polyphenols. I'll explain what they are. They're very good for you. They support uh, avoidance of chronic diseases. Vitamin E, if you look at rapeseed, it's got a lot of vitamin E. It's quite an important point. Smoke, smoke point for rapeseed is 205, whereas olive oil is 165. And therefore, olive oil is not recommended for deep fried type cooking. It's, it's fine for light foods like stir fries and things. And this char these charts just go through various different co comparisons of oils that you may be consuming. Sunflower oil is very common in the community, readily available in supermarkets. But if you look, it, it, it has a reasonable amount of calories and fats. Hemp oil, not readily available, and it has a low smoke point. Butter, again, quite high in saturated fat. Seven against 0.7. Coconut, again, fairly high in saturated fat. So the recommendation here is, is use rapeseed and olive oil where, where you can. Olive oil has a low smoke point, and therefore, as I said earlier, we avoid it for heavy cooking, deep fried cooking. It's, it's fine for lightly cooked foods, stir fries, or cold foods like a salad. High in antioxidants and anti inflammatory benefits. Rapeseed has a high smoke point. It does contain a lot of vitamin E. Uh, one tablespoon is 50% of your daily requirement for vitamin E, as an example. And it's got a good ratio of omega 3 and 6. Polyphenols, they're micronutrients that naturally occur in plants and they're best consumed through plant food. It's regarded as, as a life essential, lifespan essential uh, for, the, for the potential to reduce high risk chronic diseases. It's packed with antioxidants 
and which have a number of health benefits, including protecting us against a number of chronic diseases. Here's examples of foods that contain polyphenols. I'll let you read those for yourself. So this is just an example table of glycemic index. Umesh is recording the session. Uh, so if you ever need to get a bigger list, there is a reference I've attached. Uh, so you can have a look at this, just to take some examples. Dates, 100 glycemic index. The cherries and plums have, are in the low 20s. Lentils, 41. Peanuts, 21. Now, glycemic index is not the only thing we should look at. Uh, so although peanuts are high in protein and have a low glycemic index, it does have a fat content. So we need to moderate how much food we eat. It's a thing, and the way to determine how much is it's, it's a thing called glycemic load. So if you take an apple, for example, it's got a glycemic index of 38. For 120 gra gram serving, that's a small apple, we've got 15 grams of energy, that's carbohydrates, and the glycemic load is 5.7. The table on the right hand corner shows a low glycemic load would be under 10, moderate would be 11 to 19, and the high would be above 19. So we've got a second equation now, not only what the glycemic index is, but the volume of food we eat. So we need to take care of both, both of those elements. So coming back to this chart, I hope I've explained, when we look at 50% carbs, as, as an example, we look at quality carbs, complex carbs rather than simple carbs with low glycemic index. On the right hand side is, is a fat loss program. I'll very, very briefly describe that now. So this is a fat loss program. It's aimed at people who are obese, people who need weight management help. It's also aimed at people who have diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Uh, it takes a fair bit of planning to come up to the program in terms of exercise and nutrition. It requires a person to control their calories. As you can see, on certain days, you only have 1,500 calories. On the intermittent fasting days, your calorie count really reduces, as you can see from these figures here. Your protein carbs and fat proportions do change. And we need to do three HIIT training sessions a week. So that's quite intensive workouts for a minimum of 30 minutes, three times a week. It's better to have this program run through and managed with you by a professional. If you are in the obese or borderline diabetic category, you can get a GP referral to get professional help for free. The program is not suitable for everybody, but if, if it does suit you, your GP would refer you. Let's look at the pillars of fitness. Mindset is very important. This is how are you motivated to do the things that you need to achieve. It's just not about weight about diet, it's also about your work, exercise and sleep. The recommendation is we need seven to nine hours sleep. I'm now going to talk about exercise. We take a holistic approach on exercise. So cardiovascular training is typically walking fast, running, treadmill, swimming, Zumba, whatever you fancy that gets your heart rate up. 
flexibility and stability. This is building your core strength, increasing your flexibility through stretching routines. Yoga and Pilates is excellent for that. Mindfulness and breathing, they're part of a structured yoga program that actually help with reduction of stretch, um, stress. Need a sip of water. Finally, strength training. I've got a slide to explain why it's important for us to do some strength training in terms of weights. They don't have to be heavy weights, but they do support us with our bone density and retention of bone density, especially as we get older. Okay, people often ask me, should I do Pilates yoga or do I also need to do gym work. I think I've explained that gym work is important. Yoga and Pilates will benefit you from the flexibility perspective, improves your energy flow. Breathing techniques known as pranayam help reduce stress and improve sleep, increases your mindfulness, and can help reduce high blood pressure. Breathing also improves your lung function as well as balances your body. Yoga and Pilates very much focus on core strength, correct posture in everyday life, not just whilst you're there in the classroom. There's two types of gym work out. One is cardio. Cardio is the treadmill or your swim. They improve our heart function and lung function. They really get our blood flowing, energizers. And strength training, as, as I said earlier, is around building stronger muscles and bone density, retaining our bone density. It can avoid things like osteoporosis, fractures in, in older age. So what are the benefits of exercise? Most of us understand we can lose weight with, with a regular program, we can reduce blood pressure, I had high blood pressure. I used to take medication within two years. My BMI has dropped from 30 to 23.5 and I've come off my blood pressure tablets. My cholesterol's it's under three. For diabetics type two, it can help better control sugar, can reduce joint pain, back pain, general body pain. Because uh, you're more flexible, you're more stable, increase your self-confidence, can reduce the risk of falls, makes you feel a lot better. Whenever I teach, a lot of people come up to me and say, I feel really good after that class. You can control medications and, and health conditions like cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. There are barriers to exercise, and I'll, I'll go through and explain how we can overcome these. So you, some people may say it's really boring, you're too shy to work on your own, you don't find time to do it. It's just too much, too much pain and discomfort. I have tried, but I'm just too tired to exercise at the end of a long day. I don't have any one to exercise with. I'm really too old to start now. In your experience exercise has not been worth the effort and, and so forth. So how do we overcome the barriers? We work, life coaches and personal trainers would work with the individual to try and fit the exercises in with their day-to-day -day routine. They would pick activities that they find enjoyable and they're rewarding to them. They would begin to give examples of, you know, walking, walking up and down the stairs instead of taking the lift, getting off a bus stop or a tube station early, those sort of things. Important for us to pay attention to the benefits of exercise. And I'll discuss how we set goals shortly. And they're called SMART goals. Working with friends is very energizing. It's always really worth bodying up because you learn from each other and you, you drive off each other's energy. 
you can get professional help uh, if your health needs it and demands it through your GP, uh, which is it's a free referral that you can ask your GP for. Okay, but what are SMART goals? The first point is specific. So SMART goal is very specific to what you're going to do. An example, I've just picked an example of squats. So I'm going to learn to do squats. How will I measure that? Well, I could say I'm going to build up to 10 squats. Is it achievable? Only I will know what's achievable for me because I know when I'm starting. So for each and every individual, the thing to do is start to the things that you know are doable for you. And then you slowly build up, you progressively build up. Be realistic, start small, take small steps and slowly build up. Set yourself clear deadlines. So in four weeks, for example, you could say, I will build up to 10 squats a day. I'm working with a student who hadn't done more than 10 squats 12 months ago. That person is now doing 100 squats. Uh, so it's, it was just focus and regular attention to the things that you enjoy doing. It's important for us to be patient. It can take four weeks, a month, before you begin to see changes. A couple of months before other people, sorry, a couple of months before the changes you've introduced begin to set in, and about three months before other people, you'll notice a difference. The key is make it part of your daily routine and stick to that daily routine. Okay, some tips and ideas and the reasons why we do what we do. I talked about bone density. This chart shows the bone density of a person begins to decline past the age of 40. It peaks at about 30 and it declines at 40. And this chart on the bottom right shows the women bone density is lower than men and past menopause there's an increased risk because the estrogen levels uh, in a woman reduce past menopause. So as a as general rule, bone density begins to peak at 30, it stays flat and then it reduces. When we do strength training, what we are doing is we are helping maintain our bone density for longer. This is a very important chart. It tells you how you expend energy. Our total then energy intake is around 2,500 to 2,500 calories. That physical activity that we do, an hour's yoga class, Pilates class, those sort of things, we typically burn 20 to 30% of the energy. The food we digest, the process of eating is around 10%. But the most important point is 60 to 70% of the energy we expend is by our day-to-day -day functions, staying alive. That's walking to the bus stop, going up and down the staircase, just keeping active throughout the day. That is where the bulk of our energy is expended. So if we end up with a sedentary lifestyle, it really is bad for our health and our health will decline. So it's very important for us to remain active throughout the hours we're up, which is a good 16, 15, 16 hours. Let's look at how you can assess your risk. I've got three different charts for this. Based on a person's weight, say if a person weighs 100 kilograms and is 1.6 meters, and then they, they would come in the obese range. If a person is 100 kilograms, let's say 80 kilograms, 
is a height of 1.7 meters, then they're in the healthy range. So you can use this type of chart to understand where you are. This is a good guideline. It's approved by the NHS and NICE, and it's also a guideline British Heart Foundation use. Another good risk assessment is our waistline. For South Asian men and women, the risk of a bigger waistline is greater. It's a greater risk of obesity. It's a greater risk of diabetes. But if your waistline is 37 for men and 31.5 for women, you're in the healthy risk range. But the minute you burst into 40 inches for men, note for South Asian men, it needs to be no more than 35.5. And this is the figures for women. That means you're at high risk of becoming obese. One more chart on BMI, body mass index. It's weight over height squared. You take your weight, take your height, and you divide the weight by the square of the height, and that gives you a BMI. Underweight is, being, is no good, so any BMI between 18.5 to 25 is a healthy BMI. If you're 25 to 30, you're overweight. Beyond that, you're either obese or severely obese. It's important for us to know what our stats are, what is our weight, what is our height, what is our BMI, what is our blood pressure, and so forth. I'm finishing off with just a few slides on things that we can do on a regular basis. So exercise regularly. How much? 150 minutes of cardio. That's a minimum of 30 minutes a day seven days a week, it's important that you feel your heart beating quite fast. It's just not a stroll up and down the street. It's, it's a good paced walk and you feel your heart rate going up. Two weight bearing or strength sessions that we've discussed. Again, a minimum of 30 minutes twice a week. And I've re-emphasized the point a couple of times, take it step by step. So if you're not used to doing it, then start small and build up. Strength and flexibility can come through any of these methods. Tai Chi, yoga, Zumba, whatever you fancy. I've talked about osteoporosis and how strength training can help with osteoporosis. The other things that could cause osteoporosis is poor nutrition, insufficient calcium, and vitamin D. Staying fit, it's very important, even in the winter, to begin to do walks, outdoor walks, in the fresh air. Find a park near you and aim to do a 30 to 60 minute brisk walk. Do indoor exercises like yoga and pilates. Avoid snacking. It's so easy to snack. But snack adds calories, and our goal is to try and burn broadly the amount of calories we eat, and that maintains our weight. Stick to a schedule. Schedule for waking and sleeping patterns, seven to nine hours, is recommended. Work with your friends and family, and do maintain a high level of social contact. Keep active throughout the day. Don't get bored. I've discussed we start small and, and work up to a broader, bigger routine. Make it varied so you're doing lots of different things. Set realistic goals for yourself. Make exercise part, I'm summarizing in the next three slides, by the way. Make exercise part of your daily routine. Keep moving, use stairs instead of escalators. You don't have to do it alone, we work with somebody. Make the point variety. Set reminders so you know you have to do certain things on a regular basis. Keep an eye on progress and 
have your regular health checks and reward yourself. Maintain a healthy weight and shape. This is where your measurements come in. What is your height? What is your weight? What is your blood pressure? What is your baseline? Know those. If you monitor something, there's a better chance that you will improve it. Very, sleep is very, very important. If you, if you look at Ayurvedic or Chinese charts on sleep, your body is healing and recovering during the night when you're sleeping. So it's very important to sleep and you can't make up for lost sleep. Reduce the amount of fat, salt and sugar in your diet. Read the food labels. They're really important for us to understand. Healthy diet, the, the take five message from the NHS uh, is important. Seasonal fruit and veg where you can. Enjoy water, the recommendation is six to eight glasses a day. Get sufficient omega-3, 6, and 9. Chia seeds and milled flax seeds are good examples of uh, omega-3, 6, 9. Eat fiber-rich food, it helps your digestion. Eat whole natural foods uh, wherever possible. Spices uh, that we all love are very good for you, they aid digestion, and they're actually warming for you in the winter. Minimize or avoid smoking, drugs and alcohol in moderation. Avoid processed and packaged foods, as well as foods with additive, additives, artificial colors and flavors. Eat fresh, eat organic, eat whole, wherever you can. Limit stimulants like coffee and fizzy drinks. You know, one can of Coke is around 12 teaspoons of sugar. Avoid storing cooked food in plastic containers. They emit toxins. Reduce your stress and try and work to a better work-life balance. Work with your friends, but with your family your partner to achieve that. Within the NHS in the UK, you're entitled to a free health check uh, after 40, every five years. It is worth asking your doctor to, for your health check. It concludes the uh, presentation. It's a whistle-stop tour on a, a huge number of topics. And I hope you take something away from it. I may show it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sailesh. Thanks for that uh, excellent presentation. Um, <clears throat> we've got a few questions. The first one is, Sailesh, if someone's diabetic, is intermittent fasting something that they can do? I think it, it, it depends <clears throat> on the individual. Uh, if, they, if they're di type 2 diabetic, if the cause of that type 2 diabetic is significantly overweight, then intermittent fasting would help. But done under a controlled regime, they build it up slowly and work to a defined program of diet and nutrition. So yes, it would help reduce weight, it could also help reduce the medication and potentially eliminate uh, type 2 diabetes. Thank you for that. The next question is, um, there is sometimes confusion between dehydration and hunger. And what people tend to do is rather than drinking fluids, they'll start reaching out for food. How can one um, make sure that they, if they are dehydrated, they will drink rather than um, eat, start eating food? Uh, so I think uh, we need to get in the habit of drinking throughout the day. Uh, we need to be drinking around two liters a day. Okay. NHS recommend eight glasses a day. Uh, 
and you will know if you're drinking enough water throughout the day just by the color of urine that you pass. Um, if it's yellow, the darker the color, uh, the more dehydrated you are. So I, I, th I think the only advice I can give on, on water is keep sipping. Uh, I think very, very clear the recommendation is we don't, uh, we don't drink an hour before and an hour after uh, eating because it it liquidizes our digestive fluids that aid digestion. So we are diluting the digestive fluids in our body. But otherwise, drink throughout the day, morning to night. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll one more question. Uh, a couple of questions. So the first one of those two questions is, um, in postmenopausal women, when estrogen level deplete, there is a natural tendency for the waistline to increase due to body's natural instinct to protect bones from fractures. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? I, actually, if I'm honest, I don't know. Uh, what I do know is uh, the bone density begins to reduce past menopause. And therefore, there's a tendency, uh, it's, it's important for people to begin to, to exercise regularly, not just at menopause, but throughout your life. And therefore, what would happen is we are retaining muscle strength and, and bone strength throughout our lifetime. And that will protect us a lot more against fractures and breaks. You know, hip fractures are very common uh, with people with, um, especially women, osteoporosis, those who've not done a lot of strength, uh, strength training. There may be other causes um, which are hereditary, and those, you know, sometimes we can't control. But I certainly recommend a very, very healthy, nutritious diet, lots, 50% of your plate, should be fruit and veg, uh, and then healthy carbs and fats like we've discussed today. Thank you, Salesh. Um, I can't really, uh, I don't know the answer if I'm honest, uh, it would be on, uh, on the baseline increasing. I've not experienced it. Thank you, Salesh. Uh, the next question uh, is, there is somebody who uh, says that uh, they are not able to stand for longer periods. Uh, would you be able to suggest something with, where she can do some cardio, but uh, seated? There's, there's, uh, there's a lot of things you can do seated. Uh, we need to get uh, stretch bands uh, of different strengths uh, to help build the, the intensity on muscles. Uh, chair yoga is excellent. Uh, for people who are not able to stand. Uh, so chair, chair yoga, there's, there's dozens of postures that people can do uh, with chair yoga. And if we have time, I can actually show you a simple program uh, which goes through examples of things you can do chair, chair yoga. So chair yoga is, is a very, very good mm -hmm. alternative. You can even work in the gym. I go to a gym where a person comes in a wheelchair and he does a lot of things using the wheelchair, uh, including weights. You know, he will do rowing, for example, seated rowing. Um, you can do lat pull, which works your muscles. You can do bicep curls. You can do triceps. So there's a lot of things you can do on a wheelchair or on a, on a chair. It doesn't have to be a wheelchair. Uh, that would keep your fitness levels up. Thank you for that. Uh, just messaging somebody. Okay. Um, next uh, question I have is around the bone density. Yes. Um, 
So just just kind of uh, explain uh, to everyone a little bit more about bone density. I uh, I know what um, you know how they can go about uh, getting that uh, measured using the DEXA scan. Um, what what is a normal range for uh, bone density? The score. Would you be able to do that, please, uh, Salish? No, I don't know the scores. Um, I, I don't know what the scores are, but DEXA scan is is what the, what is used to determine if a person has osteoporosis. Right, that and, and that actually measures the bone density, the how strong the bones are, right? Yes. So okay. If you think about an elastic band. When you're young, an elastic band will stretch. As you get older, it becomes brittle. So our bones become brittle. And if you have a sudden action, that brittleness could crack the bone or the elastic band. So we're losing, you know, density is basically weight. Some things light or heavy. When we're younger, they're heavier, they're more dense. As we get older, they become, there's a lot of holes in there. I've got pictures of it actually. And then they become much lighter and much more brittle and therefore susceptible to cracking. Okay. Thank you for that. I've um, got a comment here from uh, uh, Vibhuti Ben. Uh, seen people do tai chi a little at a time to slowly build up strength in the lower limbs as well as increase bone density yes and uh, so your thoughts on that please so tai, tai chi is a very very good form of uh, art martial art uh, it can definitely help you with building strength building flexibility much more mindfulness as well uh, you will only get strength but improvement in bone density if you're doing body weight exercises uh, so standing as, as an example you're actually carrying your body's weight so standing is far better than sitting and a lot of tai chi is standing so there will be an element of benefit what I'm referring to for bone density is, is really, even if they're lightweight, regular lightweight exercises, and in the NHA, in the UK, the recommendation is you, you do strength training, weight-bearing exercises. A lot of yoga is weight-bearing, a lot of Pilates is weight-bearing. You know, when you, in yoga or Pilates, you do cat-cow, for example, or you do a down dog, those, you know, in a down dog or a cat cow, you're taking pressure on your hands, on your shoulders, on your back. So it is weight bearing. So, and, and the same goes for Tai Chi. Okay. Thank you. Um, more questions at the moment. We've got another uh, few minutes. If anyone has got any questions, please put them on chat and I will read it out uh, for Silesh to answer. Um, other than that, nothing at the moment. Sailish, uh, also you you have got a uh, training program, haven't you? Uh, which uh, you uh, you have in the past, uh, you have operated for quite some time and uh, gone through with quite a number of students as well. So I uh, I do. What I do, Umesh, is I tailor my training programs to a person's needs. Um, I was just going to see if I can find my table yoga, sorry, chaired yoga poses. Yeah. And, and just share them with people just to give us an idea. Um, Then I, I'll show you some simple, let me just share the document, if I may. I'm, I'm assuming people are interested in this. So th these are examples of some care poses you can do. Uh, I 
I know we've got some people who do practice and are yoga practitioners on the call. So the top two are breath exercises. This is for your spine. This is for your spine. It also works your shoulders. Shoulder rotation, shoulder. Long rotation. It's a full shoulder girdle rotation. Wrist, hips, triceps. This works your tri uh, triceps, your glutes. This is a very good weight training exercise. Sit ups, very good cardio exercise. Leg extensions, it works your hamstrings, chest, and so forth. But what uh, mesh, what I also do is I teach people how to do a sun salutation. And then I expand that sun salutation considerably, add lots of extra routines. Uh, from okay. a weight perspective, I build people up uh, slowly to lift weights that are suitable for their needs. Which, you know, it could be five kilograms or 70 right. kilograms. Uh, it depends on the individual. But that's just an example of things you can do on the chair. An extensive program. Okay. And I, th I think you've got a slide, if I'm not mistaken, there is a slide where you got your telephone number and the email address uh, uh, if somebody wants to contact you. Uh, would you be able to put it on screen? And whilst you are doing that, I've got another question. What are good protein for vegetarians and is protein shakes good? Okay, let's uh, answer that question. Uh, I'm looking for the slide because I've actually covered that in the slide. Okay. thought I had a slide with my number, but I'll, I'll put it up shortly. Sure. Um, how do we share? share? I hope you can see a screen which says proteins. And on the yep. right side, you can see a, a whole list of examples of good proteins for vegan and vegetarians. Yes. I saw a question where somebody asked uh, about the glycemic index link. When you publish the slides, uh, they can look up the link on uh, glycemic foods. This one and this one, there's, there's a link. Yes. Right, let me. Um, so, the second part, Salish, the uh, second part of that question was Is protein shakes good? Okay. Um, it depends on what's in the protein shakes. I don't take protein shakes myself. Uh, I would prefer to drink milk that is high in protein. An example of that, let me put up a slide again. <coughs> um, is, it, is it milk? Can, can you see that slide? Yes. On this corner here is pea milk made out of Dried yellow peas. That one liter has 24 grams of protein. So I personally drink protein milk rather than buying protein shakes. And you can buy pea, pea protein, by the way. But my view, it's a personal view, rather than buying pea protein, I just buy pea milk. 
it's got a lot of protein in it, 24 grams. Uh, for a liter. Okay. Yeah, there's a tendency with uh, with uh, protein shakes. I think there a uh, lot of things are put in there which probably may not be uh, advisable for the body. It's additives. People yes. Look at additives for taste and things. Yeah. But the key message for us today is eat as naturally as you can. Do you know mung beans mm. are healthy in protein? Healthy in carbs, have a low glycemic index. Uh, broccoli is another one. Uh, chickpeas is another one. If you're vegetarian, nuts, almonds, uh, hazelnuts, they're, they're all good protein content. To me, yeah. this is marketing. You know, when, when we go vegan, what I've got on the slide is vegan, mostly, in fact, it's all vegan food. Um, but when you go to the supermarket, you can buy vegan sausages, vegan beef, uh, burgers, and so forth. It, it, it's all marketing. You can make perfectly good burgers using the contents of material that we show here. Please avoid the marketing, stick to natural whole foods where you can. I'm just giving you a personal view. I agree with you, Selish. Okay. Um, okay, one, one, a couple of more questions. Um, what are the best nuts to eat? Oh, uh, I would say all nuts in moderation. Um, But very, very small portions. Peanuts are very strong in protein, for example. So I would use, I would say, use the nuts that you like the taste of, but use them in small portions, a, a small handful. Don't binge on, on nuts because they are fatty. And the worst one is, worst type of nuts, is it cashew? Cashew is very tasty, and I have a handful of cashews regularly. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's 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 control what enjoy what you eat, but control what you eat. Is oat milk good? I um I nearly put in slight. Oat milk is good, uh, and I I. I only drink plant-based milk. We really have cow's milk. So oat milk, hazelnut, almond, pea milk are all good milks. You can even buy organic uh, oat milk now um, uh, in, in supermarkets. It's double the cost of um, non-organic oat milk, but you can buy it. It's amazing how uh, the big supermarkets have started stocking all these. Uh, at one time, you could hardly find, uh, you know, almond milk and uh, coconut milk and all that. But now, all supermarkets do various different forms of non-dairy. Yeah. So I I like the sprouted beans example that's just been given. Yes. Uh, really good for you. <clears throat> these are sprouted mung beans. Great. Okay. I think uh, no, there aren't any other questions, and we have we are at uh, five past three o'clock as well. So nearly coming to an end to the event. Uh, Salish, thank you so much for uh, this uh, afternoon's excellent presentation on well-being um, and holistic, a holistic approach to healthcare and putting in uh, fitting in the lifestyle exercise and nutrition as part of the well-being. Thank you once again for your time and thank you to everyone for joining this afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.